Welcome back. After a four-month-long hiatus, we here at Twin Takes Fantasy Football are finally back here on the YouTube machine. And what better way than to kick off our fantasy football content for this season than with a 2023 NFL mock draft. With the actual NFL draft about a week or so away at this moment, this is the pinnacle of off-season excitement for football. So sit back, relax, remember to like and subscribe uh, to the channel, and I'll see you on the other side of that intro. Welcome back into Twin Takes Fantasy Football. Yes, we have been gone for a long time, but I am not gone for ever. Just been dealing with a lot of stuff. As you can see, I am in a new recording area, had to move places, but gave me a chance to update some of the systems that I use, some of the software. Obviously got some sports memorabilia in the background over on this shoulder. Yep. Um, you know, doing the full on sports podcaster thing, but you didn't hear, you didn't come here to hear me talk about why I've been gone for so long. You came here for the absolute chaos that's going to ensue in this mock draft. So, right here on NFL Mock Draft Database, let's get into it. First pick going to be fairly chalk. Uh, I will say this is going to be what I consider a predictive mock draft, basically taking in NFL rumors, historical trends as far as drafting, what I think you know, what I've listened to from GMs, what GMs are saying. So not personally what I would do in this situation, but more so what I genuinely think could potentially happen on the NFL draft day. So we'll see how wrong I get it. But again, first pick is going to be extremely chalk. It's just a great marriage of the actual talent that Bryce Young possesses and the rumors coming out of the Carolina Panthers at this moment. I mean, despite the size concerns, he is the best uh, quarterback prospect from the way he navigates the pocket, the way he creates outside of the pocket and just his arm talent uh, and the accuracy with which he places his throws on his passers. And there was kind of some rumors about CJ Stroud being uh, the apple of the eye of all the Carolina Panthers coaches. But recent rumors have been saying that there's a lot of support for Bryce Young within the organization. So when there's a marriage of talent, scouting, and the rumors around the NFL, I think it's very easy to say Bryce Young is number one overall. Moving on to the Houston Texans, I know there's been some smoke screens around them wanting to trade down. They don't want a quarterback if Bryce Young isn't on the board, but I just don't think that is true. They've been in such a miserable area with Davis Mills for the past couple of years that they're going to have to select a quarterback, and I think they really will select a quarterback. Um, and that's going to be the second best quarterback in this class, in my opinion, which is going to be C.J. Stroud. I know it's people, there's a narrative around C.J. having the same representative that Deshaun Watson had. And listen, I get it, but there's been quite the turn, organizational turnover with the Houston Texans, new coach, Bill O'Brien's gone. It's going to be okay. I think they're going to be mature. They're going to be men. They're going to get past their differences. And Houston's going to take the best available quarterback prospect, which is going to be C.J. Stroud. Moving on to pick number three. Um, most people, again, more rumors about Arizona loving to want to train down. I know they would love to trade down, but the issue here is if you want to trade down, you have to find someone to trade up. And I just don't think, listen, Anthony Richardson, tremendous athlete, tremendous prospect. His value was skyrocketing after the combine, but I think people are calming down a little bit. Uh, I think the media is calming down a little bit as we get closer to draft day. I don't think there's anyone that wants to trade up and give up the immense amount of capital to come up to number three, uh, just to take a shot on a guy, either an Anthony Richardson or Will Levis, both guys that are massive projects and have very, very low floors. Uh, so I think Arizona's going to have to stick and pick here, which is not the worst. They've lost so much uh, talent on the defensive line that Will Anderson would be a smash pick for them. He is the best defensive player in this draft, bar none. Um Super solid blue chip prospect. They need edge rusher. Will Anderson is one of the best prospects we've seen in many, many years. Very easy pick right here for the Arizona Cardinals. Moving on to pick number four. It uh, really comes down to quarterback. You know, they've, they've done the veteran quarterback. Doesn't work. They finally are in a position to draft a quarterback. So it's going to be either Anthony Richardson or Will Levis here. Personally, Given the coach that they brought in, Shane Steichen comes from the Eagles organization, has done tremendous with Jalen Hurts, who is a tremendous athlete, really brought on enough coaches. And he brought, Shane Steichen did bring coaches with him that did help improve Jalen Hurts' accuracy. So I think given the athletic upside of Anthony Richardson, you're going to swing for the fences, Jim Ursay. Um, also a stupid narrative was he put out a tweet with the quarterbacks and Anthony Richardson was first. However much you want to read into that, I wouldn't. I would just read into the quarter. Uh, the, 
head coach that he hired and his ability to work with a quarterback such as this. And then just, just the absolute insane athletic upside that Anthony Richards possesses, Richardson possesses. So the Colts are going to take Anthony Richardson right here at number four. Number five, this is where we're going to get a little crazy and just hang, hear me out. First off, Jalen Carter. Okay. There's been a lot of character concerns that he takes plays off, and I just don't think that with the new Seattle Seahawks, it's going to fit in really well with their culture. They're a team and a head coach in Pete Carroll that really prides themselves on having a tremendous culture and guys that want to commit to playing uh, every single snap and commit to the team. And I just don't think that you know they're going to risk taking a Jalen Carter if they do have those serious um character concerns and I'll spoil a little bit. I'm going to have Jalen Carter falling a little bit. Cause I think a lot of teams have, you know, just the way he's approached this draft, the way he was at his pro day, not being able to finish all of his uh, drills, uh, not taking, you know, meetings with teams outside the top 10 just shows a lot of concerns that I think a lot of people are going to pass on. So now we look at, you know, what's the next best place. Um, Tyree Wilson, they could certainly use an edge rusher. Boy, Mafe is not, you know, the next JJ Watt over here. But I think Tyree Wilson has been hyped up quite a bit uh, by the media. I think his stock is more media-driven rather than actual NFL-driven. Um, from words around from GMs, he's not as high in the pecking order as most media members would have us believe. So maybe the Seattle Seahawks aren't as high in him here. Uh, qu- cornerbacks, obviously you're looking at either a Christian Gonzalez or a Devin Witherspoon here. Uh, two guys that don't really fit Seattle C- Seattle's way of drafting quarterbacks uh, in their cover three scheme. They really like to go for tall, long athletic quarterbacks. Um, and I just don't see Christian Gonzalez or Devin Witherspoon being the type of cornerback they want to draft. I could see them really going after a Keely Ringo or a Julius Brents in the second round. So why would they waste a top six pick on one of these guys? Again, a place that I want to take the top time to pause and say, listen, a place that they would love to trade down from, but in order to trade down, you need to have someone that wants to trade up. And I just don't think in this, you know, five to 10 area of the draft, we saw it last year with a lot of teams, a lot of uh, analysts saying like, listen, you could trade down from here, but the, just the capital to get into the top 10 just doesn't match the value of the players left on the board here. So I'm going to go with Seattle Going to take a wide receiver here. Yes, they're going to take Jackson, Smith, and Jig, but we have seen the value of wide receivers skyrocket in recent years. We saw the trades for Devonta Adams, A.J. Brown, and Tyreek Hill last year, and we've seen so many wide receivers go in the top 10 in the past years. I mean, and Jackson, Smith, and Jig, but I know he has the injury concerns, but this dude is elite. I mean, Chris Olave and Garrett Wilson were both the 10th and 11th pick in the draft overall, respectively, last year and when they were asked who was the best wide receiver in their room at Ohio State they both said Jackson Smith and Jigba I think Seattle with an aging Tyler Lockett could go all in uh, right now with Geno Smith on the new contract and, and select Jackson Smith and Jigba I think that would be a fantastic pick and not really it's a little bit of a reach but I think they would do, they would do it and uh, you know his main concern was playing out of the slot I think there was another slot wide receiver that came out of the draft three years ago his name is Justin Jefferson pretty good right Moving on to Detroit, uh, going back here, they got just traded away Jeff Akuda. They brought in Cam Sutton on a multi-year contract. They have um, Emmanuel Mosley, a one-year contract. The biggest need for Detroit right here, no need to overthink it, is going to be cornerback. And my cornerback one on the board is going to be Christian Gonzalez, just from the fact that I think he has uh, so much good tape, not only in his time at Oregon, but also back in Colorado. Uh, One of the things we look at as far as uh, hit rates of defensive players uh, especially when it comes to DBs. Is, is, are they one-year wonders or do they have sustained production? Uh, and Christian Gonzalez has, has been an above-average cornerback um, for his time both at Oregon and at Colorado. He is not just a one-year fluke, and he's also insanely athletic. I think he would be a perfect fit in the Detroit uh, offense or the Detroit defense there. Um, moving on to pick number seven, we have the Las Vegas Raiders. So many different places they could go here, but – I think um, just given the way that if this had been done a couple weeks ago, I might have given him Jalen Carter. Just you think um, Josh McDaniel has a lot. He has a God complex. I'm really certain that he does have that complex where I think he can fix any player and he can, you know, do what it, he's going to save this player. Or he's going to get the most out of this player. But it did come out that Las Vegas said he's completely off their board. So uh, being as this is a predictive mock draft, we're not going to draft him here. What we're going to do is we're going to fix one of the worst 
areas, the Las Vegas Raiders have been at perpetually bad for years and years and years, and that's going to be at the offensive line. Uh, take the most pro-ready, technically sound offensive tackle in Peter Skaronski. He can play tackle, he can play guard, he can play all over the field. Um, just the most surefire way to bolster that offensive line, especially with bringing in Jimmy G, is going to be Peter Skaronski, and I think it's a no-brainer pick right here. Um, at Atlanta, going back... There's a lot of places they could go here, but I think as far as bolstering that defensive line, that's where they could really um, pick up a ton of value here in the draft. And you're thinking I'm going to say Jalen Carter, but I don't know quite a bit. I mean, yes, they have the Georgia connection, but given that it is a fairly tumultuous organization, um, an organization that we haven't seen, you know, have too much success in recent years. You don't want to bring in someone that's going to upset the apple cart. You want Jalen Carter needs to go to an organization which has been established, which, you know, they have a good culture already in place. Not so much how much sure how much I believe in Atlanta's culture, but what I could see them going here is with an edge uh, and Arthur Blank, Arthur Smith, both the Arthurs there. They love physically gifted athletes, and that is Tyree Wilson. So to help their defensive line, Atlanta's going with Tyree Wilson here at number eight. Number nine, this is where we're going to end the fall for Jalen Carter. Obviously, Matt Eberflus is defensive coach. Um, I think that with uh, Justin Fields there, with some of the pieces they brought in this offseason, I think you know they can take that upside on a Jalen Carter. Again, if they have concerns about him, that's fine. But this defensive line is in, so, is in, is in such shambles that this would be the place that I feel comfortable taking a swing on a Jalen Carter. So he goes here at number nine to the Chicago Bears. Number 10, uh, Philadelphia Eagles. They were mocked court, uh, cornerback for quite a long time. However, they brought back both Slay and James Bradbury, both on three-year contracts. And I think using a top 10 pick on a cornerback would not be beneficial to their win-now motivation. I mean, this is a team that just paid Jalen Hurts $255 million with 180 of that essentially guaranteed, 179 if you're being picky. Um but they need a guy that can come in and play now. They need a, a player that can come in and be effective and help them. They're, this is their winning window. They need a player that's going to help them immediately impact their chances to reach a Super Bowl. Um, and so that's key number one for the Eagles. Key number two is that offensive players, this is an offensive-dominated league. I think the team is shifting more to offense wins championships rather than defense wins championships. We saw that in the Super Bowl last year against Kansas City, one of the more high-scoring um Super Bowls, and obviously the offense was what propelled Kansas City to win. It wasn't really the defense. I mean, what team had the best defense last year? It was the Denver Broncos, and where were they during the playoffs? Oh, sitting on their couch at home. Uh, number three would be just the fact that it is incredibly more likely or more the hit rate on offensive players translating to the NFL is about 20% higher than defensive players. So it's much more of a risk to take a defensive player in the first round of the NFL. I'm not saying that they're all busts, but it's about 40% hit rate for the defensive players to 60% for the offensive players. And finally, what I am so convinced that the Eagles are going to take B. John Robinson is just the way Howie Roseman talks. I don't want to say, oh, how he never takes a running back. Oh, how he never does this. How he never does that. He was on the New Heights podcast with Jason Kelsey a couple weeks ago, and he talked about his theory around why he drafted Jalen Carter last year um, and how he's always trying to be one step ahead of the rest of the league in how he built a team builds. And his little literal words for Jalen Carter was, this is a guy that normally would have been a top three pick 10 years ago. Why is he falling to the 13th pick? B. John Robinson. Well, let's look back to Saquon Barkley. Um, Ezekiel Elliott. These are guys that are all top five picks. Why is he falling to number 10? Well, I think how he's going to look at the absolute weapon that Bijan is, not only as a running back, but he's also a wide receiver. He's also a good blocker that can help, you know, chip now that Isaac Samalo is gone. Uh, so Bijan Robinson here. I know it's a spicy pick, but to the Eagles makes sense. A lot of sense at 10. Um, at 11, we're going to have our first trade of the night. So let's look at it here. It's going to be between uh, the Tennessee Titans. And we're going to move here to the New York Giants. So this will be the trade. We're also going to throw in um, second rounder next year. Boom, it's accepted. Not going to throw it. I mean, it's probably more in real life, but we're just trying to get through the mock draft here. I'm already taking too much time. But think about it. What area historically have players have teams tended to trade up for? It's the wide receiver. What area do they trade up for? 
the 11 to 16 or 11 to 20 range, they trade up for wide receivers that are still on the board. What is the one piece that New York Giants are missing? It is a big bodied X wide receiver. Uh, so I think it is very likely that they would trade up here to go and snag Quentin Johnson before the Texans try to grab him at 12 with JSN already off the board. I mean, you have Saquon on the franchise tag. You just signed um, Daniel Jones to a deal. This is your win now window in a very, very weak NFC. I think the one remaining piece, they traded for Darren Waller. They just need to get that big body wide receiver to compliment, you know, um, Isaiah Hodgins and Darius Slayton and the rest of that very small speedy and Wandale Robinson, obviously, in that wide receiver room. So they're going to trade up for Quentin Johnston. I love this trade a lot. I haven't seen it anywhere, but I would not be surprised if someone of that caliber, they traded up, the Giants traded it up to take a wide receiver. So now that Quentin Johnson on the board, Quint, uh, Houston is now very, very upset, which is going to um, trigger another trade. Because now Houston, they're looking, they're eyeing Quentin Johnson, but now they're just going to trade back. So we're going to have them trade. Whoops, go back to manual. Uh, we're going to have them trade. Let's see. Houston Texans. They're going to be trading with the Pittsburgh Steelers. So we'll see. We'll give them perfect. Wonderful. So Pittsburgh right now, I know there's a legacy with Joey Porter and Joey Porter Jr. There isn't even a cornerback, but listen, the whole mantra for the Pittsburgh Steelers this offseason has been build the picket fence. They need offensive tackle. It is dire. That offensive line is absolutely atrocious. So the fact that Paris Johnson has lasted this far, I in they're going to jump up right ahead of the New York Jets to come and snag what could be the best offensive tackle in this draft class. So now the Jets here, um, yeah, they're kind of bummed that Paris Johnson Jr. is off the board. But guess what? They definitely um, managed to stay. Uh, they managed to hold off on the Jets trade. They managed to keep their 13th pick. I don't think the uh, I don't think the Aaron Rodgers trade happens by the time that draft night rolls around. So they still will be picking with their 13th overall pick. Uh, maybe they make, maybe they make the trade for a second rounder after this pick goes off the board. But right now there's one major area of um, need for the jets, especially with injury, especially with aging players. Uh, Dwayne Brown has not, he was okay last year, not great, but they could really use an upgrade at the position to protect their new investment when they end the eventually trade for Aaron Rodgers. That's going to be Broderick Jones. So now we come back to the New England Patriots, and they're actually loving how this uh, draft fell to them. Um, Devin Witherspoon, a guy that a lot of people have as their top corner in this class, a lot of people have as a top 10 uh, pick in this draft class. I have him falling here a little bit just because he was a one-year wonder. He was a starter for three years at Illinois and didn't really, he had average or below average production. And then he just completely went off. Um, cornerbacks who have only one year production in college typically have a very, very low hit rate in the NFL. But I think he does have um, some of that mental fortitude that New England would really, really appreciate when it comes to uh, increasing a need on their team, which is cornerback. So they're going to go here with Devin Witherspoon and be extremely, extremely happy. So now we're getting fast and furious here. There's a lot of trades in this mock draft, and that's because a lot of people when they do mock drafts, they like to do a couple trades early on and then they just let them fall off. But that's really not really how it happens in the real life NFL. Trades happen all the time, especially after the kind of like the 15th pick. People are trading constantly. Teams are going up, down, left, right, and center. So we're going to actually have a quite the flurry of trades coming up here, starting with a team that wants to come up and get Will Levis. That team is going to be the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. So let's figure this one out. We're going to trade up with the Green Bay Packers. So they're moving up four spots just to jump in front of the commanders who could potentially be taking a quarterback given Sam Howell and Jacoby Brissett is their current. Uh, let's see. We'll give up the third round this year. Perfect. Love that. So they're going to take Will Levis. Uh, a lot of people love to give tight end to the Packers, but I think it's just not a premium position. I think they can trade back and they can wait on tight end and it's not going to be that big of a deal. Um, it's weird how people say both running backs and tight ends are positions that are quite devalued. However, they're all about multiple tight ends from this class going in the first round, but no running backs going until, you know, 26 to the Cowboys when you could say this, but everyone's going, Oh, it's arguably one of the best tight end classes in, in recent memory. This is the best running back class in like a decade. So it's not, I think out of the realm of possibility that, you know, running backs get taken early and often here and, tight ends fall. I think the media kind of is hyping up the tight end position a little bit more, but back to Tampa Bay. Um, 
I mean, they still have Chris Godwin. They still are holding on to Mike Evans. Uh, they re-signed um, Levante David. There's a lot of pieces still in play with this team. I know it's going to take a couple years to get them back into, you know, competing, but you know, it will take a couple years for Will Levis to develop and what um, perfect opportunity it is to, you know, take a Will Levis here, take a shot on him. Hopefully he, uh, you know, builds and can develop into a nice quality quarterback in the years to come to replace Tom Brady, which is going to be big shoes to fill, but you got to take your swings Uh, for the Washington commanders here. I have them taking a cornerback. It's going to be Joey Porter jr. Um, just a clear cut, really great press man cornerback. Uh, he is tremendous when it comes to ball skills, very athletic, kind of just the all around the do it all corner. He's, um, a guy that I think will slot into their defense really nicely and really upgrade a uh, position of weakness on their defense. Um, I mean, they really showed, showed up their offense, their, their defensive line, uh, this past, uh, off season, handing out a bunch of different contracts and then without a quarterback on the board. I mean, they do have a ton of offensive weapons. I love Brian Robertson, and Antonio Gibson as their combo in the running game. Scary Terry, Jahan Dotson, I think is, you know, a, a top 12 wide receiver duo in the NFL. Um, and I think again, tight end is a position that they can wait on for a while and address in the second round and be just fine with like a Sam Laporta or a Lucas Musgraves. So Joey Porter Jr. With the premium at a cornerback position is here. They will be taking him at the 16th pick. Now, Houston Texans, they trade it back and they still get a wide receiver, a wide receiver that I am a huge fan of here. Um, Obviously, they invested in C.J. Stroud, so why not give him weapons, especially after trading away Brandon Cooks? They're going to need uh, some help for him, so they're going to be taking Jordan Addison. I don't understand why Jordan Addison's falling down the board so much. Well, I take that back. I do understand why he's falling down the board so much. He weighed in very light at the combine, and he didn't run well, but I am... Not inclined to throw out his combine numbers entirely, but I'm going to dismiss them just because when you look at it and scout a player, it's more about what you see on, I think, the biggest uh, indicator of, you know, transitioning to the NFL is going to be what you see on film. And I saw a guy who has tremendous play speed, and then I, I, I think he's very much quicker than the 40 time he put down at the combine. And I think that's backed up by there's some numbers. Uh, there was a study done on wide receivers, and Addison actually ran on average on his roots was a mile and a half a mile per hour faster than Jackson Smith and Jigba. So I'm going to say that his play speed. And when I see, when I watch him play, he is so fast, so nimble with the ball runs exceptional routes. I think he's uh, going to be a tremendous player at the next level. And Houston, frankly, could be looking back at him at number 17 and saying they got a steal. So Detroit lions here at number 18, a guy that I really, really like, they're going to take Lucas Van Ness. This is a player that I think could actually go much higher than this, all the way up to potentially um, number 10 uh, to the Eagles, depending on how the board falls. I just think he is uh, tremendously athletic. He has the inside-outside flexibility uh, to rush the passer um, from A-gap, B-gap, you know, from the outside. Um, just really, really athletic defensive lineman, and I think he's going to be very explosive. Um Yes, the Detroit Lions already have Aiden Hutchinson and James Houston, but they could rotate Lucas Van Nessen to really, really shore up that defensive line on the inside and pairs very, very well with Christian Gonzalez, who is their first pick at uh, number six overall. So I think Lucas Van Ness and Christian Gonzalez are a fantastic draft haul for the Vikings here. Now to Green Bay. We talked about the positional value of tight ends. I personally don't think there's that much of a positional value of tight ends, but again, this is going to be a predictive mock draft. And again, I don't like Telton Kincaid. I'm very adverse to 25-year-old prospects. I'm very adverse to prospects who rise up the draft board well after the season has ended. I don't just, I'm not as high on Telton Kincaid as the rest of the league or the rest of the analysts. However, a lot of people seem to like him. A lot of rumors coming out about him to Green Bay. They do need a safe, another pass catcher uh, after they lost Alan Lazard to the Jets um, there for Jordan Love. And we all know that rookie quarterbacks and in inexperienced quarterbacks they love their tight ends to lean on and use their tight ends as a safety blanket and i think dalton kincaid really fits that well i don't love the pick but it's a very consensus pick we're gonna go with it uh seattle seahawks they are going to really bolster their defensive line again there wasn't a defensive pick that i loved at five so we reached on a wide receiver and i still love that jackson smith and jigba pick for so many reasons including a reason i touched on later which is you know the viability of offensive positions hitting more frequently than defensive positions but right here you got to take a look at some of the uh 
defensive talent still left on the board. You have Miles Murphy, Nolan Smith, Brian Branch, Deontay Banks. This is a place where I am so, so comfortable with taking a guy to a bolster um, their defensive line. Again, they have a Brian Branch, Deontay Banks, but we talked about in the first pick. They probably don't want those guys. They are probably targeting Julius Brantz or Keely Ringo in the second round. It's just the type of you know physical traits they admire in particular cornerbacks, and they know they can get them later on in the draft. So right here, a guy that's kind of fallen down in mocks recently is going to be Miles Murphy, but I still think he's fairly athletic. I think he's kind of those, you know, he is a product of overthinking uh, a bit when it comes to a product, but, you know, truly raw athleticism, very insane when it comes, very prototypical build for an edge rusher. And I think Seattle's going to see his athleticism combined with, you know, his sheer physical ability um, and being bigger than Nolan Smith and really like what they see in him and think he could make a great addition to their defensive line. So they take Miles Murphy there. Los Angeles Chargers, um, they need an offensive weapon. They need it bad. Uh, it's time to move on from Josh Palmer, time to move on from. Um, DeAndre Carter is time to move on from uh, Gerald Everett. And I think they just need a field stretcher. They really need to open up uh, Mike Evan or Mike Williams is not the field stretcher. They thought Keenan Allen's really a possession guy. They're also both getting older. Um, and this is a wide receiver that I like a lot more than others. Um, it's going to be Jalen Hyatt. And so the reason I'm taking Jalen Hyatt over Zay Flowers, and we can go into this on my upcoming tease, upcoming wide receiver rankings, but there have only been about seven wide receivers, 5'9 and below, that have had over 10,000-yard seasons since 2000. Six of those seven seasons belong to Steve Smith Sr., who is an outlier, and the other one belonged to Marquise Brown, a.k.a. Hollywood, now down there in Arizona. I don't bet on uh, outliers, so I'm really down on Zay Flowers and Josh Downs comparatively just because they are so small of stature. Jalen Hyatt, though... Um, he is a freak athletic, and I think his stock is dropping, frankly, because he comes from that Tennessee system that really isn't NFL. Doesn't tra- People say it doesn't translate to the NFL, and then they manufacture him getting open. If you can manufacture someone getting as wide open as Jalen Hyatt was, why would not every team do that? It just doesn't make sense. Like If it works, why is not every team copying it? They were so dynamic, and before Hendon Hooker went down to injury, they could have been arguably one of the top two teams in the country with Georgia. So... I mean, if it's so easy to scheme people open with how open Jalen Hyatt was, why isn't Georgia doing it? Why isn't everyone doing it? It seems like a cheat code. I think there are still inherent traits to Jalen Hyatt that make him such an elite deep threat and such an elite separator that Chargers will take a chance on him right here. For Baltimore Ravens, uh, they need help. They brought in Odell Beckham Jr., so I don't think that they are in love with any of the wide receivers here. I think Zay Flowers doesn't offer them anything that they don't particularly have between Odell and uh, Rashad Bateman. Um, so we're going to defense address the defensive side of the ball. They lost Chuck Clark. They lost Marcus Peters. Their secondary is absolutely hurting, and they're going to take the best defensive uh, secondary player available. Not Deontay Banks would make sense, and I would consider Deontay Banks here, but Brian Branch, you do know how Baltimore loves their Alabama players. And Brian Branch, he's listed as a safety here, but he can play He can play boundary, he can play slot, he can play strong, he can play literally anywhere in the secondary. I think as a Swiss Army knife, rotating him all around, um, Marlon Humphrey and Kyle Hamilton, I think is going to bring um, definitely some ferocity back to their secondary and, and Basically, a very, a very Eric DaCosta pick going with the uh, Alabama player. That's what it is. Uh, Minnesota, I know I just, um, let's see. Actually, no. Here at the 23, I do have a trade, and this is due to a lot of rumors coming out that the Bills really want to move up. They really need an offensive piece to help them out, and I think with some of the, you know, Teams coming up in Jacksonville and Tennessee and Dallas, they are going to want to jump ahead of them, and they're going to want to get their offensive tackle of choice. So they're going to trade up here. It's going to be Minnesota Vikings. And we've also seen in recent history that Minnesota very much okay with trading down. If they don't love any players here on the board, very happy to just scooch on down the board. Um, Buffalo Bills, let's find them. So 23, 27, we're also going to kick in a third rounder next year give you a fourth rounder back cool beans let's do that um so great now uh, now buffalo is on the clock and they are going to be taking darnell wright a very very um 
I think he's almost as good as Broderick Jones, uh, a little bit smaller, a little bit less of the prototypical size, a little bit shorter arms. However, he has very quick feet. He is very athletic. Um, and I think he's a guy that can push the pocket, especially with when you want, um, you know, Josh Allen being mobile, being outside the pocket, really pushing um, run schemes and getting and bootlegs. And when you really want to drag the pocket left and right, Diana Wright is a um, very athletic tackle who can help stretch that pocket, help move the pocket and make um, a lot more easier throws for Josh Allen, as well as help him, you know, scramble as well. So I think this is a fantastic pickup for Buffalo. If Darnell Wright falls to here, they could certainly trade up and try to snag him. Next we have the Jaguars and the Jaguars. Um, I think this is a really simple pick here. Unfortunately, lose out on Darnell Wright, but that's okay. Another caliber of offensive tackle. We're going to really see a lot of offensive tackles go off the board here. Uh, they lost... Um, God, I can't think of his name, but the guy that just signed with the Kansas City Chiefs, which was a huge blow to their to their offensive line. So they're sitting here looking at Anton Harrison. Anton Harrison, you know, maybe not as good physically or athletically as Darnell Wright, but certainly a better pocket protector, uh, certainly a better pass protector uh, than Darnell Wright is. And I think with the way that Trevor Lawrence plays the game, they will be very, very happy to pick up Anton Harrison here uh, as he is a more prototypical pocket passer than Josh Allen is. So they'll be picking up Anton Harrison to hopefully um, not lose too much with the loss of their right tackle to the Kansas City Chiefs. Uh, Tennessee here... Um, they traded back, traded back quite a bit, but that's okay. I don't think they're really in any desperate need to get a player in this particular draft. We've seen, you know, with cutting Taylor Luan, potential trade rumors of Derek Henry, potential trade rumors of Ryan Tannehill, that they just want to move on. It's time to break it down, rebuild this team. Uh, they got to go from the ground up. And a guy that I think is going to be pretty... Um, a guy that's going to take a little bit of time. He's coming off of a pretty bad injury. It's going to be Nolan Smith, but definitely a guy that I think fits the, you know, athleticism, the just the dog in him that Mike Rabel loves to see in his uh, defensive line. I think he would be great. You have Jeffrey Simmons uh, as a true pocket pusher up the middle, and that gives Nolan Smith a lot of flexibility to come in off the side and rush the passer. Um, just being undersized yet extremely athletic, I think that pairs really, really nicely, and it allows him some time to, you know, re get acclimated because um, he's been out of football for so long, just gives him time to you know keep healing from that injury, and he doesn't have to really be an impact player from day one. So I think Nolan Smith here is going to be an incredible pickup for Tennessee Titans. Dallas, um, they're actually going to trade back. Unfortunately, they have seen how the board lands to them, and they're just not thrilled with the way uh, everything has gone down. So we're actually going to have them trade with... The Cincinnati Bengals. And I'll explain why in just a moment. As soon as I can figure this out. Cincinnati. Cincinnati will give up a fourth round next year. Perfect. Um, you know, picking up draft capital, they've addressed a ton of their needs in the offseason. They brought in a wide receiver and Brandon Cooks. They brought in another cornerback and Stephon Gilmore. They have done a tremendous job uh, as filling the necessary immediate holes on the roster. Um, and... You know, running back, I don't think they reach on a running back here at the back of the second. But, you know, right now you see Minnesota here who has a true cornerback need. Um, and I think Cincinnati, just because of losing Jesse Bates, because of losing Von Bell, because Eli Apple is not that good, I think they could trade up and try to grab a, grab a value in Deontay Banks, uh, just basically jumping over Minnesota. Because if he's there for Minnesota, Minnesota is going to grab him for sure. Uh, Dallas will be happy to pick up the capital uh, going forward, uh, as they're probably not too pressed for any particular guy um, in this list right here. So Cincinnati trades up gets ahead of Minnesota. Their secondary took a huge loss um, this past offseason with losing both of their safeties. Now, Deontay Banks is not a safety, but they do have, um, I believe it was Dax Hill, uh, a guy that, you know, hopefully they drafted last year that's going to come on strong this year, and Deontay Banks uh, hopefully provides an upgrade at some point of the cornerback room uh, for the Cincinnati Bengals. We know it is a vital, especially in the AFC um, to have a very, very strong secondary, and that's what they're doing here, especially with how many offensive tackles are currently off the board. Now, Minnesota, now they're pounding their fists. This is not a situation in which, um, you know, 
2021 where the Eagles took Jalen Rager and let Justin Jefferson fall into the lap. No, Cincinnati did make the right choice here, so Minnesota has to pivot. Uh, I do think getting rid of Adam Thielen opens up a massive um, need at wide receiver, so that's where they're going to go. I know I just finished trashing Zay Flowers earlier, but I think Zay Flowers actually works perfectly as a number two to um, to Justin Jefferson. Um, and you obviously have this field stretcher still in KJ Osborne. I think Zay Flowers will slot in right there and be a very, very good complement to those two receivers. I think it's going to take the right situation for Zay Flowers to be productive and to have him be successful. And I think Minnesota could be that situation. I know they could address cornerback. There's a lot of defensive needs um, for Minnesota, but it looks like they're keeping Zadarius Smith as of now after a little um, snafu early in the off season. And I think with how deep this cornerback class is, they can look to address that position somewhere uh, in the second round. Moving on to Dallas here. Um, frankly, it's, a matter of what they need they they're gonna take Michael Mayer here it's a pretty slam dunk pick to me I personally have Michael Mayer ranked higher than Dalton Kincaid I love what he does as an all-around tight end he's a blocker he's a great pass catcher I mean he's been comped to Jason Witten and I don't think that's a wild comp and I think Dallas would love after get letting of Dalton Schultz walk down the road to Houston Texans in the offseason I think they would love a Jason Witten to come in be a third pass catching option for them so Michael Mayer you are a Dallas Cowboy and this is a tremendous value I don't understand why Michael Mayer has fallen down the draft board so much um, here uh, New Orleans they're going to go just for the best player available uh, in their in their mind um, and here's a good time I'd like to take to address why Kalaja Kansi has fallen so far. Analytic heads love Kalaja Kansi, but a lot of that comes from helmet scouting. He went to Pitt. So did Aaron Donald. He's a freak athletic. So is Aaron Donald. He's undersized. So is Aaron Donald. But there's actually some things about Kalaja Kansi that they're not pointing out that make him even more concerning at the NFL level. He is, you know, he has much shorter arms. I think he has like three inch, inch shorter arms than. Aaron Donald, and just as far as getting leverage and rushing the passer, no one knows how it's going to translate to the NFL. He also played at Pittsburgh. He didn't play against SEC talent. He didn't play against, um, you know, NFL-level talent that normally resides in the SEC. And, again, Aaron Donald is an outlier. I know I've talked about this later, and you're going to hear me talk about this all throughout the off season, uh, off the off season you know, evaluating rookies, evaluating players. I do not bet on outliers. I don't bet on outliers. Um, so, Clash you can't see. I think he's great, but I just don't think he has like this upside. And I think a lot of people are just getting really swayed by the helmet that he wears. And without Aaron Donald, I mean, Clash you can't see probably isn't a, is, is a second round player. I, I could see the Saints taking a risk on him here, but I personally see them going more with a Brian Bressy, uh, a guy that, you know, depending on how well he interviews, he was a top. He's like a number one recruit coming out of high school. He was a top prospect at the beginning of this year. Had a really down uh, year. A lot of that was due to off-field stuff with his sister passing away. You don't know what kind of effect that takes uh, on the mental capacity of a young man uh, in college. But he still has is a freak athlete. I think he wasn't used to his full potential uh, on the Clemson defensive line. Clemson themselves had a pretty down year. So I think New Orleans is going to see the upside of the actual physical traits that Brian Bressy has. And they're going to take a shot on him here at the end of the tw- uh, end of the first round. Um, and as I finish just slandering Clyde Shikansi, he's now going to go here to the Philadelphia Eagles, uh, a team that, you know, the same reason they were able to take a shot on B. John Robinson at 10, they're able to take a shot here on Clyde Shikansi. Um They already have a fantastic defensive line with Hassan Reddick, with bringing back Brendan Graham, bringing back Fletcher Cox, drafting Jordan Davis. I think they don't have, you know, a guy that needs to be a star pass rusher. They can have Clyde Shikansi come in and be a secondary or tertiary option. Um, and then... Uh, he is freaky athletic, a guy that I really, really like, and I do like to bet on athletic some traits. So he's going to go here um, to Philadelphia. We're going to round this out. Um, obviously, Kansas City, they could trade up. They could trade back. One of the picks that I had thought about here was going to be the Lions coming back in and trading in for Hendon Hooker. Definitely think Hendon Hooker could be a first-round talent. Definitely could see someone trading in uh, here at the end of the first round for that fifth-year option. Definitely on the board. Definitely my alternate pick. I want to definitely highlight that. However, we're going to just assume here that uh, Kansas City sticks and picks. um, And we know they need edge edge rusher. And I think also 
This is a pick that I do want to highlight as well because there's so many good edge rushers left here on the board. There's like this tier two of edge rusher, whether it's Will McDonald, BJ Ojolari, Adetimiwa Adeboraré, and Felix Anadiki Uzama. And you can also throw in Keon White as well, but there's this really good end of the first, start of the second round edge rusher group. Um, and it's just basically pick your flavor, pick who you like. I know Will McDonald has been mocked there a lot, but for me personally, Adetimiwa Adeboraré is so freaking good. And just some of the athleticism numbers, I mean... If he runs as a D tackle, just the athleticism traits are, are just out of the gym. I really love what he can bring to a team, especially since they let go of Frank Clark in this offseason. Um, definitely a guy that I think could be a massive impact on the defensive line sitting next to Chris Jones. And they already have they already have their power guy in George Karloffis, who they drafted last year. So you can have some guy who has a lot of speed to power, a lot of edge rushing ability, and just, again, a freak athlete like Adam Adeboare. I like him as a first-round talent. I think he goes in the first round. So he's going to be my um, obligatory pick here uh, at 31. Um, and this mock draft is letting us pick uh, for... Pittsburgh, but that's it. We're not going to pick for Pittsburgh. I didn't plan it out. I'm not going to try to do it here on the fly. That is my first round mock draft. Um, let's give him Will McDonald. Let's see if it's going to recap it for us. Oh, no. They don't have a fantastic way to recap all of our picks, but I'm going to read them off here so you have a recap. Number one, Panthers take Bryce Young. Two, Texans take CJ Stroud. Three, Cardinals take Will Anderson. Um, number four, Colts take Anthony Richardson. Five, Seahawks take Jackson Smith and Jigba. Christian Gonzalez to the Lions at six. Peter Skronsky to the Raiders at seven. Falcons take Tyree Wilson at eight. Bears take Jalen Carter at nine and end his fall. Uh, Eagles go for the swing on a running back with Bijan Robinson at 10. Giants trade up to take their wide receiver X of the future in Quinton Johnston. Steelers trade up to grab their offen- the best offensive line tackle prospect in this class, which is going to be Paris Johnson. Jets settle for Broderick Jones, but don't trade the pick to the Packers. Patriots go and get their defensive back, uh, the guy that they like that fits the Bill Belichick mentality in Devon Witherspoon. Buccaneers trade up for Will Levis. Commanders settle in uh, for Joey Porter Jr. Take the local East Coast guy to sure up their defense secondary. Texans take Jordan Addison, a very underrated wide receiver in this draft class. Lions take Lucas Van Ness to sure up the inside of their defensive line. At 19, Packers go for Dalton Kincaid, which I don't totally agree with, uh, but they take tight end here. Number 20, Seahawks bet on the athletic traits of Miles Murphy. 21, Chargers take the field stretcher, the dynamic separator in Jalen Hyatt. Number 22, Ravens go for the Alabama player in the biggest shock in the world, which is Brian Branch. You know how Eric DaCosta loves his Bama boys. Uh, Bills trade up with the Vikings to snag their offensive tackle because that's they got eviscerated there by the Chiefs pass rush, and they're going to take Dar- uh, Darnell Wright. 23, 24, Jaguars take... Uh, Anton Harrison to replace the right tackle. They lost in free agency. Titans, after trading down, take Nolan Smith as an edge rusher to pair with Jeffrey Simmons uh, on the outside uh, as they begin their rebuild and don't need immediate production from Nolan. Number 26, Deontay Banks goes to the Bengals. Number 27, Zay Flowers is going to be the best complement and the best situation for the Minnesota Vikings. Number 28, Cowboys select tight end Michael Mayer, a better tight end in the draft, in my humble opinion. Saints go with the physical traits of Brian Bressy and betting on the prospect that he was before this year. 30, Eagles set uh, their sights on Kalijah Kansi, athletic freak, um, who doesn't have to be the alpha in an offense, can sit and actually rush the passer, passer next to um, Fletcher Cox and Jordan Davis. And finally, we round it out with Adetumiwa Adeboare out of Northwestern for the Kansas City Chiefs to replace uh Frank Clark, who they lost on the edge. That is my draft. Pick it apart. Tell me what I got wrong. Tell me how dumb I am. But this marks the time that we are back. Twin Takes is back here on YouTube. So excited to do this mock draft. I worked really hard on this for like two weeks. Um, Not something I just did on the fly, something I really gave thought and time to and think that could potentially some things that are crazy that could happen in the actual NFL draft. And there's going to be a ton of draft content coming out. Trust me, I'll be doing videos almost every day or every other day leading up to the draft, doing my positional rankings. Got a lot of stuff to catch up on, guys. So until then, take care.